years old and I want to be a model. I would like to be a model. I want 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 to be a model. Ever since I was little, I've always had the aspiration to pursue modeling. I'm very worried that I'm too old, but I heard when I was working in New York when I was about 16 that you're old at about 25, and when I graduate, I'll still be 21, so I still got four years to get something under my belt. I've never been to California. When you tell people that you know that you're going out to LA, they're like, oh my gosh, how cool. But then there's always that fear of nothing's going to come out of it. And then you just wasted a bunch of time and effort. Even if you were the model of Kansas City and you were working in Kansas City, you would maybe make 10 to 20,000. From stories I've heard, I feel like in LA, as a model, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm worried about rejection for sure, but I think anybody would be. Judgment from others would be a definite possibility if I came back and nothing happened. But I don't care what people think. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I've always wanted to do this. There's people that actually walk in the door and they're adamant. They want to be a model. And I try to steer them to the acting industry because that's a little bit more uh, forgiving. And I look at them and in my head, which I would never say to them in person, dear God, when have you ever seen a model that looked like you? I think maybe I find one girl I approach, and I mean maybe once every six months. It's hard to find a model. I find there's a lot of talented kids out there. A lot of kids who could sing, a lot of kids who could dance, but the model is physically, it's got to fit into some sort of a, a, a mold. It's something that only a very few set of people, I think, can do and, um, and do it seriously. I think a lot of young women want to be models because of what they're seeing on television, what they're seeing in films. They're seeing a whole lifestyle presented to them. Beauty is a multi-billion dollar industry, and models in our society are the benchmark for that beauty. Beauty is like money. It's a currency. The modeling industry sells a lifestyle. It looks very glamorous and easy. People just assume life is easy, childhood was easy, their sex life is perfect. Bullshit, are you kidding me? Every person that sits in my chair, bar none, has major insecurities. I think every human being has major insecurities. It's just whether you can swallow those insecurities and get on with the job you're, that you're there to do, whether that's to be an actress, to be a model, to be the makeup artist for the day and not worry about myself. I think every human being is so bothered by who they are nowadays. The funny thing about the topic of beauty is that it's an obsession for everyone. Granted, if you look in the mirror and you have a pimple, you get very angry and it ruins your day. Conversely, everyone comes up to me and says, what can I do about this? What can I do about this? What do you think about this? Look at my hair, what about this? It's just a fascination that women and ma men have all the time. When it gets to be an unhealthy fascination, that's when I say, I'm not talking to you anymore. Beautiful people receive you know, a higher quality of life as opposed to people that may be what society deems as average. So we attain or aspire to be more beautiful on the outside because we feel that it'll improve our quality of life. But a model isn't just beauty, it's, it's more than that. It's an attitude, it's an air of confidence, it's an aura, it's a mantle that they carry, an unseen mantle that they carry with them. It's terrible because for me, I see so many girls in the street that I say, oh my God, she's beautiful, she can be a model. And some people say to me, she is a model. <laughs> it's not something that you can build or make. I think that 
you can see an outline. I mean, you can have a vision when you look at somebody and say, oh my God, this girl can be gorgeous. And you can work around that, you can build on that and ultimately get there. But I think for some girls, getting down that path is very difficult because there is a lot of rejection. The way the camera sees you is everything. It's just it's something the camera captures. Sometimes a girl will come in and she's absolutely drop dead gorgeous and she takes a horrible photo. And then another girl will come in that's sort of on the plain side and she photographs amazingly well. But if you get in front of the camera, if you're not confident and you haven't worked out your angles, because there's being found and discovered, but then you've got to harness your talent by sitting in front of lighting, watching how it lands on your face, how you look better on this angle, how you look better from this angle. What, what's your one weakness in your body that you always need to compensate for? With Kate Moss, that's her height, and she does a very good job at making you believe that she's just as tall as all of the other models. She just, she works it so well. And she's just a fucking badass. She's just like the James Dean of the model world. If you're only good looking, it's not enough. It's a work. It's a, really a job. A good model has to be an actress as well. There's many different areas in fashion. There's the high couture, high fashion. Those girls are a very specific look. They look a little bit kind of like alien sometimes. Just fascinating to look at their faces. You can get lost in their face. As a scout, that's what, you know, you look at people's faces everywhere. You're non-stop, it's constant. Every time you're out, every time you leave your front door, you're always looking at faces. It really is a needle in a haystack. Excuse me. Hi, hi. I'm a scout from um, LA Models and New York Models. I think you're very pretty. Is it something you're interested in, possibly? <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know. How old are you? 13. You're 13? Okay, I'm going to give you my card. Um, if you get mum or dad to look at it and look at our website. Our stylists pride themselves on seeing a new model who they've never seen before and just saying, she's got something special. Lara Stone is not your classic beauty. She does not look like Nadia or Giselle, but those lips and those teeth, she's different. She sort of has a quirky kind of look, but it's gorgeous. If a 14-year-old girl is sitting at home and seeing a picture of Lara and sees that Lara's teeth have a gap in them, and this 14-year-old girl always wanted to fix her gap, and now she thinks, my gap is beautiful, or my nose is as big as, you know, that model's nose, I'm not going to do anything about it. Because it's about celebrating individuality. To do fashion and editorials in LA, it's almost impossible to get models that are worthy and it sounds horrendous it sounds so awful but the new york models i mean a lot of the a lot of the big ad agencies and big clients they'll they'll fly the models in in a heartbeat because you just can't get those proportioned women here don't get the six foot five alien-esque looking girl. No breasts and slender hips. And I mean, it's a specific runway proportion. You don't find women like that here. legs for miles and those save me every day because my body isn't perfect and everyone perceives my world to be so glamorous a wonderland when it's not exactly that i live in the lower east side which some people think is dangerous but it's really not like we're all fine down here two pretty girls and we survive just fine from my day 
And I just want you to see what my apartment has turned into. This is our counter. This is the kitchen. This is my pile of shit on the floor. My bed is a mess because P.S. I sleep on the pullout because I need the TV. So like as a model, you kind of have to like dress nice and like have a sense of style. And that's just not a skill that I have acquired yet, but I'm working so hard on it because IMG is one of the best agencies and I do not want to disappoint them. So I'm working really hard to live up to the expectations. When I watch America's Next Top Model, I believe I could do that. I want to be a model because there's a lot of cute girls in it, and just get me girls. I love clothes and makeup, and if I can do that as a profession, that'd be really cool. I think it takes a lot of practice and a lot of hard work. You have to, like, take care of your skin a lot, and, like, you have to, like, be prepared every day. You have to eat a lot. If someone is youthful looking and healthy, I mean, I saw something on TV this morning talking about men are attracted to youthful looking women be with great skin because that, that implies that they're fertile. The industry is not fascinated with a 15 year old. They're more fascinated with the youngest and healthiest looking skin. And that means at 15, you had less opportunities to abuse yourself. So you look better and fresher, like peach. You have a call back tomorrow. Okay, so I'd like to welcome you. Let's all give you some small I started when I was 21. I kind of started late. And I am now 60, and I still work. All the models still do work, but it's really a function of client demand and public demand, advertising. So older consumers would uh, quite often want to buy things that are modeled by younger people than them. It's sort of a fantasy or an image or a dream to still look like that. I think I could be a model because I have good posture and uh, really good confidence. People have told me I look like uh, Taylor Lautner, so it just kind of, you kind of have to do it after that. Male models, sheer perfection. I mean, at this day and age, working out is a huge fad right now. Everyone wants to work out, everyone wants to get fit. It's just the right proportions, the right height, the right look, the right smile, the right genetics, the right ab structure. I think it's definitely tough right now in this day and age to be a male model because everyone wants to do it. I was labeled the first male supermodel. And that was largely because that word supermodel, which is kind of a cheesy word, happened with the group I came in with. I came in the group with Cindy and Christy and Claudia and Naomi and Stephanie Seymour and Linda. That was my pack. At a certain point, the question was raised, well, if there's all these female supermodels, you know, who's the guy? My career is peaking at that time. You know, I just uh, ended up with that. I love the idea of coming out of this Ivy League school and basically saying, eh, I think I'll be a model. A lot of people think, especially at that time, that only, only gay guys go into the modeling business, male modeling business. And I would say that certainly was what most people thought. And we heard a lot of that from, from your mom right. uh, and dad. I think that was higher on their list. I said, what? what's going on? And so I think it probably raised some questions at the time, although Certainly myself, Christian, I mean, we certainly knew John's background and thought that would be uh, highly unlikely. We had a very traditional family to a certain extent. You're going to finish college, you're going to find a, a woman, and you're going to get married, and that's going to be your life. And then John's going to go and be a model. It's like, we're like, well, what's going on here? <laughs> there was all this, always this other part yeah. of the modeling that that kind of reared its ugly head and got uglier and uglier as things went on. What do you think the stereotype is for a male model? Dumb. Yesterday, I was playing soccer on a field. It was just a random soccer game, and, and I realized, whoa, like, everyone's looking at me. They're looking to me to be the leader, and it's because I'm a tall, handsome guy, you know? And some of that, I got more confidence from, I think, becoming a model and seeing how other people saw me, I think beautiful people have an advantage, uh, for sure. I think men are just as vain as women. If you go to a spa or a nail place, there are just as many men in there having 
manicures and pedicures or facials or their hair colored as women. I mean, look at the two guys that are in the street in front of Hollister. If you're down there at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and they're down there with their washboard little tummies, everybody in the street is having their picture taken with those two guys. I mean, to me, it's, it's amazing. Growing up, I really wanted to be like a huge model or, you know, be put on billboards and this and that, but then I realized, you know, people would tell me, like, get into this, get into that, you look like X, Y, and Z. I'm just like, eh, you know, give it a shot. Hi, my name is Corey Brandt, quarterback number four, Spiegel's High School, Mustang. You see Corey Brandt roll out of the pocket there and hits Halloran crossing in a crossing route. When you look at athletes in general, they're more attractive. You know, they're just super symmetrical, you know, they're lean, they... And that's also probably like the poise and the confidence and like projecting, you know, like beauty, like from within or whatever you want to call it. Tom Brady is obviously ridiculously good looking. Mark Sanchez, the same thing. It's like a whole package deal. In high school, I can remember one of um, his teachers saying to him in the classroom, Corey, if I had a dollar for every time I heard a girl mention your name, I'd be a millionaire by now. I mean, he was uh, very well liked, not only because of his looks, but of his, his great personality that went along with it. His junior final report card was a uh, 4.8 GPA. So to achieve that, yeah, he was pretty darn smart. At Abercrombie Fish, I just work retail as of now. It's called like a model position. You like work in the store, you help out customers. They wanted me to do the greeter, which is like the shirtless greeter. You see them all over the big flagships and everything. And uh, you stand up front for four hours and you get paid pretty well. I wanted to do that, and then I just get my shirt, and it's like, all right, let's lose a little bit more weight. And I was like, all right, cool, you know, come back a week later, lose a little bit more weight. It's like, all right, cool. If you show a little bit of skin and you, like a real physical image of them, when you first walk in, like you get like a little bit more money. It's nice. You don't want just a straight tool standing there, just like not moving. Like, that's no good. You want to be able to talk and actually like represent the company in a respected manner. So, I don't know, it's kind of fun. I, mean, I haven't done it yet, but. I just want an opportunity to like, you know, have my image cast out and just cast a good light. So I got like a more of a bigger plan with it than just the basis of being a model. I used to be the fit model for Calvin Klein for two years. And I would stand on a box in his office with him and the designers around me, and they would design their khakis, their cords, and their jeans to my body because I had the same measurements as Calvin. I go for beauty. I always look for beautiful women and good looking guys. If you looked at my head sheet uh, of men, they were all like matinee idols. They all were handsome. And I remember back in the, the 90s, I would talk to Rita and I'd say, Rita, where'd you get these guys? They all look like they're homeless, dirty, uh, scraggy, you know, uh, hair matted. I said, where are these guys from, you know? Oh, that's the look, that's the look, that's the look. It took me 25 years to be able to say to a male model, dude, you smell like B.O. Forever I'd be like, oh my God, how do I tell them they stink and they're on a way to a job? And now I just go, dude, are you wearing underwear? And you stink. And they're like, oh shit, I should have showered. I am the total opposite from that. I, I like a good scent. For example, right now I'm wearing a Chanel, blue de Chanel. I like to dress with good clothes. This is Express shirt. Uh, these jeans are from Hollister, I believe. My shoes are polo. I like the good stuff. The phrase supermodel was created for Cheryl Teagues. When Cheryl was renegotiating her contract with CoverGirl, we presented her as a supermodel, not as Cheryl Teagues. This is Cheryl Teagues, a supermodel. And the guy at Gray Advertising looked at us like we were crazy. He said, what's a supermodel? He says, well, he said, Cheryl Teagues, a supermodel. And why she is is because kids know her name. The kids who buy CoverGirl know who she is. They know what school she went to. And that's when they started using the girls' names in the cosmetic ads. I never forget Maybelline would never put anybody on the contract. And finally, they came around to wanting to put Christie on the contract. Maybelline was not a high-end cosmetic. So I said, look, why don't we just do one ad for you? We'll give you an ad and we'll give you an option. Christie was a little hesitant, you know, because it wasn't the big prestige, but Maybelline, little did we know, was gonna go wild. And, and sure enough, after the first ad or something, they wanted her, they really, really were hooked on her. And that's when we did this big deal. And Christy wound up with a really 
fabulous Maybelline contract, and she put Maybelline on the map as far as I'm concerned. Supermodels in the 80s, they were just business-minded. I think girls today don't view this as their lifelong career. It's like a fun kind of thing to do, but I don't think they see themselves doing it in five years or 10 years. They, they're just not of that mindset. Got one girl, she's um, 14 years old, and she's just turned 14. Her day rate already is ridiculous, which baffles me. It baffles me, and it's, she's got quite a big family as well, and she's the main breadwinner in the family. At the end of the day, their life has changed. I started modeling at the age of 12 and a half, so that was very young. In my era, it was unheard of. I got a lot of interviews as the youngest supermodel, quote unquote, the youngest model to hit the runways in Europe, or I was the first black woman on the cover of Mademoiselle and I was only 13, that was in 1989. For the first like two years, I had to say I was 16 or 17. I mean, what job as a 13 year old do you make tens of thousands of dollars and you don't have to do anything but like pose? I moved out of the house against my parents' wishes at, at 14 and I moved to Paris. One of the reasons why I think I was able to achieve the superstar status that, that other models weren't um, able to achieve at such a young age is the look. I started at a modeling competition. Agents from all over the world, it was called the IMTA. Agents from all over the world were judging. Here, there's gotta be 300 agents and managers, good agents and managers, who are gonna look at every kid here. showcase and I think it's a good experience but you've got to also explain to kids their limitation as long as they know what they're getting into uh, nobody here tells them you can be a model it just took off it was one of those things that uh, I was tall I was a chameleon I could wear business attire I could wear sexy sexy attire for I mean an 11 year old but I was innocent I still am but um <laughs> you know I don't know how I got pregnant but uh <laughs> Today I'm here in Newport Beach, California, which I love. Woohoo! To judge the Miss Newport Beach pageant. There's little Miss, there's Junior, there's Teen, and then there's Miss. It's just the misses of all the Newport Beach. Most uh, beauty pageant contestants and winners don't necessarily make good models because they're trained for beauty pageant from an early age on, which is not the same thing as a fashion model. Well, I've been involved with pageants since I was 17, and through this whole experience, I would have to tell you that my philosophy on pageants is that pageants are a sport, it's not reality. Because girls don't stand in swimsuits and high heels and walk around like that every single day. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful body. Okay, I've had my little um, experience with the pageantry. This is my Miss Wisconsin pageant dating back to, embarrassingly, 1974. See, I was, uh, what, 18 back, oh, I shouldn't tell you my age. This is just a rival with the um, crown that I had as a Miss West Dallas. You have to win a city pageant to go to the state level. Here's my uh, little speech at the microphone, which I don't remember what that one was. How can you save America, I'm sure. If you could meet anyone, who would it be and why? If I had the chance to meet anyone in this world, I would have to say it would be Mother Teresa. This is the embarrassing swimsuit competition. <laughs> we look so old there, it's just crazy. Terri Ann Mewson, who was a Miss America in the past, Miss Wisconsin, and our guest of honor, uh, Colonel Sanders. 
I had gone into beauty pageants uh, because there was a scholarship award and I needed to find a way to finance graduate school. I needed to find a way to pay off significant student loans. Miss West Virginia! She's Kelly Anderson. She's 23. She lives in Clarksburg, West Virginia. See, I'm hoping to get in New York for modeling this summer and see how that turns out. Uh-huh. I was attending a pageant in London as Miss United States. After the pageant was over, the Miss World organization offered me a job. And that job sent me to Rome. While I was there, there was a very freak snowstorm in Europe. Basically, Southern Europe shut down. I was doing a little sightseeing. Standing at the top of the Spanish Steps, out walks um, Eileen and Jerry Ford. And Eileen Ford walked up to me, completely out of the blue. I knew who she was. She was an American icon. Even if you weren't interested in modeling, most people knew who Eileen Ford was at that time. And she said, who are you with? I said, my girlfriend. She goes, what agent? I said, I don't have an agent. She said, you're with Ford now. I immediately, she hustled me into limousine. And that day, I shot Valentino for Harper's Bazaar. And the reason they did that is because the girls were stuck. People couldn't, girls couldn't get in from Milan, couldn't get in from Paris, couldn't get in from New York. The trains were shut down, the airports were shut down, and they had no girls to shoot. They were ready to go, the clothing was there. It was whole couture week with no models. Now, mind you, two years earlier, I'd been turned down by Ford. But here I was, a young girl in Rome, no makeup, my hair was cut off, none of that Southern beauty that I thought was necessary. and. They took me right away, and I started my career as a model. I was at the right place at the right time. If I were to do the shirtless model thing in front of Abercrombie, um, it's definitely an opportunity to become discovered. Uh, Senator Scott Brown of Massachusetts was a Ford model, and now he's in politics. The modeling for my political career definitely isn't going to hurt. It's like, oh, you're good looking, but you have a political mind and you want to give back. You know, standing out there with, you know, your shirt off and smiling, you you see how everyone else responds to that individual. It's if you can get a crowd of people to come around you for no reason other than having your shirt off and being friendly and projecting that, it presents a good opportunity, which is you know something where, like I still would like to do it at some point. Um, I just fortunately, unfortunately haven't been able to do that. In 1983, when I was modeling in New York, I decided to come out to California for pilot season. And I was here for about one month, and my photo was in uh, Jerry Esposito's home where he cut hair. And someone came in to that barber shop to, to get his haircut. It was Alan Carr, who produced Where the Boys Are 84. He saw my picture and he goes, that's my star. And it was like a Lana Turner story, that's Schwab. And they called me in based on that photo and I auditioned for the movie with Lisa Hartman and I got it. Yeah, today's the big one. I'm excited. I feel OK as of now, but I think I'm going to get pretty nervous <laughs> when I get there. <laughs> I hope they like me, and I hope I make a good first impression. I like to think that being nice is a good first impression, but um, also being pretty confident, too, so that not cocky, but confident. Even in Kansas City and St. Louis, I get criticism for beauty and all of that stuff too. It's very hard when someone's critiquing you constantly. <laughs> I've tried to have some tough skin about that kind of stuff. If they don't like your look in this industry, then kind of screwed. I think my portfolio will be hopefully looked at as diverse and strong, I hope. So I feel like taking direction easily, being easy to work with is always good too. I've been told I can play like a 15 year old and I've also been told I could play a 25 year old. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> if they told me I needed a nose job, I don't know if I would do it, at least not at this point because I'm still young enough to where I don't think that kind of stuff should matter as much, but I feel like, and I don't know if I have the money for a nose job. <laughs> I work at Cosmetic Care Plastic Surgery Center. Oh, the most common surgery is breast augmentation. We have an excellent non-invasive liquid facelift that actually adds fillers and Botox and can really take years off your face instantly. 
whether it's just an enhancement and especially in a down economy, you know, sometimes people are down on life and they come in and they just, just need a little boost and it's really been a great asset to helping to give that boost. It shows. If it's not natural, it shows. People know. People might be nice about it, but it shows. Here's the deal with plastic surgery. If you look like you've had it, it is over. I can spot a Botox face a mile away. Um, it's pretty much 90% of the people I see living in Los Angeles. The most common comment I get after plastic surgery is, I wish I'd done it sooner. I don't know if they really look at themselves in the mirror and see what's been done, but we see that with so many celebrities. We look at how drastic their procedures have been, and like, what did you think when you woke up? I mean, when you saw yourself after you healed, because it's, it's probably far worse than you were to begin with. It's like if you have a room and you're redecorating the room and all the furniture is old and you put in a brand new sofa, sometimes it makes the whole room look worse. I had a model call me the other day and say, oh my God, there was this new procedure for my lips. You've always been so honest with me. Can I come in and show you? Okay, I could see her from 20 feet away and all I could think was Daffy Duck, are you kidding me? So she came in and I was like, oh my God. She was like, Oh shit, oh shit. As far as getting the lips, the fuller lips, it has a somewhat of a sexual component, but I think talking to men and women about whether or not they find that attractive, I think it's pretty much hands down, no. This is what I say to all of the young girls and I even say it to my daughter. I wish this product would have been around when I was 30 because by doing a little bit, just a little bit of Botox, at 30. Your lines would never get any deeper. I just think there's an OD approach where you start to look really generic and robotic. Uh, would I do cosmetic surgery? Well, nothing's happened yet, but uh, when it comes around to, yes, I would. <laughs> you could look at the most beautiful woman walking down the street and you talk to her for five minutes and she's, oh, well, I've put on weight or, oh, well, I want to be a bit this. I don't know, I've got a big chin. I've got like a man chin. I got it from my dad. A little, it's a little obnoxious. I feel like sometimes like I have a horse face, but other than that, eh. It's this permanent striving for perfection and, and women are obsessed with it. Women and men now. There's no such thing as perfection. And if you're striving for perfection, then you don't get it. Because perfection with plastic surgery is an ugly thing in my opinion. Perfection is boring. Men, as we age, maybe some lines and some wrinkles, but then it's character. I mean, you still want to look great, but it's more accepted than the women. And it's so competitive that, uh, well, even at the young age, you see women are just beginning in the industry that will get procedures done. And I'm not just talking about Botox, but other procedures, more invasive procedures, because they know they have to have that edge to succeed in the business. And when we're born and we have little brown spots on our cheeks, they were called freckles. And they're so cute. And then we get older, those same exact freckles that were cute, are called sunspots and we get older still and those exact same freckles that we had at age two or three become age spots and it's the same exact brown spots. I don't think it's necessarily going to give you any more longevity than you already have. I mean your career is your career when it's finished it's finished. do is human attractiveness research studying what beauty is and then uh, imaging faces to see what it would take to make them more attractive. People say beauty is in the eye of the beholder which means that everybody's concept of beauty is different. Well I wasn't so sure that was the case because when I was walking down the street as a graduate student looking at women and I was with three or four other guys almost always we agreed who was attractive and who wasn't. One of the things we do here is facial imaging analysis where we actually take faces photograph them and then put the mask over them and change the face in a realistic manner to see what they would look like if they looked more like the mask. The top models in the world, a lot of them fit the mask very closely. There's the mask. There it is over her face. You can see her nose is real wide here. And she's not really that beautiful when you look at her, her nose and her lips are crooked. Her cheeks are nice, they're nice and wide, her eyes are nice. The, the thing about her eyes though is they're unusually wide. If you take uh, see how the eyes of the mask are in farther than hers? She has wide cat-like eyes and that's what makes her uh, attractive and unusual and real high cheeks. So it's really from here up that she's real attractive. From here down she's really not. 
Now see if I make her face more symmetric, and she's more attractive, yeah. People are so used to pretty faces, they become kind of humdrum. A beautiful model really doesn't do it like a model who's really different looking or odd. The people stay with the ad longer. It's not that it's more beautiful. This is more eye-catching and maybe even disturbing to the person that they'll watch it longer. Okay, here's Paris Hilton. That's her normal face. Okay, and this is after I morphed it to the mask. Post-production and retouching in photo shoots today is used 100% of the time. You can take a photo that's quite average and do remarkable things with it. Gorgeous here, actually. <laughs> Where I am right now, normally it's probably about 50 degrees and it's almost 90 here, which is awesome. Oh, my boyfriend's definitely very supportive. I mean, we're both very encouraging of each other. I mean, obviously we love each other, but we're not gonna stand in the other one's way if they wanna do something. I mean, my boyfriend trusts me and yeah, I might be with better looking guys and stuff, but it doesn't mean they're better people, so. It's more the boyfriends that get in the middle of things. Because if a model or a girl comes from a small town and they have a great relationship and so on, and then she goes off to the big world, and it's a very insecure situation for the boyfriend from the small town that, uh, you know, his girlfriend is now at parties and events and photo shoots, exotic locations with good-looking people. It's not very comforting. My name's Kyla, and I'm nine years old. Hi, I'm Mom. And I, I work more than... More than she does, I guess they. <laughs> I have a daughter who's six, and his name is Gracie, and she wants to be a model. I think it's important that a model has to be pretty. Yes, yeah, so we went to New York and spent about $10,000 so that Gracie could uh, get her start in modeling. You know, in 25 years, you come across degrees of mothers. There's a lot of overbearing stage parents, and they are the ones that always tell you that they're not a stage parent, but they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. And the child has to have fun. It has to be something that they enjoy doing, uh, because otherwise it's not gonna work. There is encouragement, and then there is pushing them to fulfill something in their own needs. It's very hard for a parent that wants their child to succeed so much in the beauty industry to not look at their child as beautiful. But they're looking through a lens that's not realistic. Right now, we are at least escorting her to different places for the job. As every parent worries about people you wouldn't want your daughter or son to get involved with, uh, my husband knows Kung Fu. I encourage him to do whatever he wants to do. We're training, I think, in every conversation we have at home because I think modeling and acting does more for a child than just a profession. It actually improves many areas of their life and prepares them for adulthood and, and professional life, successful professional life. We're probably spending, not including drive time and, and just investment of time, but actual hard cash, you know, $20,000 a year. Why do you want your daughter to be a model? I want her, I'm gonna cry, gosh. Um, I just want her to follow her dreams. And if that's her dream, then I want her to do that and be successful. Why does that make you emotional? Because I love her so much, and when I think of her, I just, I just, I, I, I just want the best for her, and it's really important to me. Pursuing modeling is something I'd really do want to like do for my mom. My mom's relationship with mine is, um, it's pretty surreal to be honest. We've uh, kind of been through a lot together. We've become like more than just mother and son. Um, it's kind of a relationship where it's like almost like two, two best friends kind of going through life together and experiencing the highs and the lows and being there for each other. My son is adorable. <laughs> He's probably got that six pack going on right now. He's uh, very tall and, and just gorgeous. So when I told her about the modeling thing, she right away really supported it. She's like, kind of like the hard ass on me. 
And on those mornings of Pop Warner football, getting him ready to be the quarterback, I'd rough him up, chase him up the stairs, and I'd be like, let's get ready to rumble. And we just, I'd get him all in the spirit of football. It's like, let's go, Corey, win that game, win that game. Like, as soon as I come home, I'm like, well, I've been kind of, you know, feeling it out. She's like, no, like, either you commit or you don't. So I, I encouraged him to get an agent. Let's, you know, get going on that physically, you know, work on your body, do what they want you to do. I mean, he's very attractive. Get that eight-pack, six-pack, or whatever they want you to have. She would love to see me on the camera, on the big screen, on a picture. Like, she would, you know, die to have that, be able to tell her friends and show her friends this and that. So she's been nothing short of, like, great to have on my side. I'll be there on that first day he takes his shirt off. Absolutely, I'll get my picture taken next to him. <laughs> what do you think of models? Too skinny. Too skinny, too unrealistic for kids' goals. Not so smart. Driven. Oh, you're so much nicer. I um, had an experience in one job where a stylist handed me my shoes and socks. She goes, here are your shoes, here are your socks. First put on your socks, and then put on your shoes. And I looked at her, I said, you're kidding, right? And she goes, no, you have to put your socks on first and your shoes. I said, well, I know what to do, but I said, you're kidding that you think you need to instruct me that way. It was, you really are, in so many instances, I found really looked at as just an empty, casing. None of my friends read. Would you go to a photo shoot that, you know, you found online on Craigslist? No. I mean, that's common sense. I was on Craigslist or something, and I saw that they needed models to host this Playboy event. And so I was like, I've been working out, so I was feeling good. I was I can do that. You know, they needed certainly service. And so when I go in, it's a guy's house. I, when I saw that, I was kind of like, this just don't seem right. This shouldn't be in a guy's house. And when I get there, and so they tell everybody to get naked. And no shit. And I was just like, nah, man, I'm, I'm going to go back home. <laughs> One time I had to go on a casting for Emilio Ungaro, and they wanted me to get on my hands and knees and crawl like an animal. And I was like, what? You know, but that was them. And I, I didn't get the job because I refused to get on my hands and knees and crawl like an animal. I was like, y'all are crazy. <laughs> yes, my first paying job was pretty uh, important. Um, it was the um, an underwear ad for Bonjour, I think Bonjour jeans at the time. So they came out with an underwear. So I was very excited because I thought, oh, well, they, you know, they think I'm pretty built. I can go in there. And um, I'll never forget it because first I find out the picture is only of my crotch. So they didn't even want my face. And secondly, I've got to go into the, the uh, makeup room where this makeup artist who is um, clearly gay, you know, which is no problem, but he's like, well, you know, I need to stuff your underwear now. I'm like, really? <laughs> so I'm sitting there just trying like, okay, this is all right, just just focus. You know, this, this is just pretty professional. And luckily it was a female photographer. And so when I came out, she's just like, what did you do to this guy's crotch? because he looks like Long Dong Silver. So in the end, they took the stuffing out and what you actually saw on the back of buses was all me. As a society, we place a huge importance on beauty, but at the same time, we despise it because I believe that innately in nature, it is our nature to be envious of those, of things that we lack. And models who tend to be more beautiful than the average woman tend to inspire or invoke that, that feeling of envy or jealousy within another person, male or female. It's human nature. You know, you want the job. You want the guy. You want the lifestyle that's being sold. I think it's something that, you know, you can't control your feelings, but you can control your actions. So, and it's all, it's about professionalism, which is really hard when you're 14 or 15. A lot of cattiness in modeling, I think. A lot of attitude, a lot of ego, obviously. Everybody's, it's all exterior. I think for myself, I had a hard time. I never had female friends. Amongst the best looking people, they are the ones that have the most jealousy. They're the ones that are looking. You know, you have to have, a, I think you have to be a very well-rounded person to be able to handle your good looks. There's a lot of assholes out there, and there's the whole crabs in a barrel theory. People trying to pull you down as soon as you get to the top. I would say that it's a lot worse with the women. I don't think it's it's a nasty competitiveness. I think with, with women and other women, I think there is a um, an observation in in that you get something from it. Like she's really beautiful. I love her hair. I love her shoes. I love the way she has it looked together. Hi everybody. My name is Jennifer Ramirez. 
I am 21 years old and I want to be Miss Newport Beach because I feel like the title can help me reach my goals as a humanitarian and I really, really want to make a difference in the community. Thank you, everybody. So if there's anything I would recommend any beauty queen learning, what any song to learn, it would be the national anthem. I actually do hold the world record published in the Guinness Book of Records for singing the national anthem at the most events within a 24-hour period. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the took some digitals of me and looked at my portfolio and said that they would talk it over with the team and get back with me. So it's upsetting when you think that they're going to be falling all over you and they don't. So I'm hoping to be standing out front of that store before August starts. So that gives it like two and a half weeks, three weeks. But I mean, I've been telling you that for a little while now and here I am still no, we're not being able to do it. So soon, hopefully. So I would like to represent the company, even if it is just with my chest and my abs. Good morning, sweetheart. How are you? Good morning, LA Models. I know you're so excited. <laughs> much better. I waited in the lobby for a few minutes and then somebody called me back and she looked at my portfolio, so I had done a lot of work and I seemed like she was impressed until I was like, yeah, I plan on moving out here. And then it was kind of like, oh, well, you don't, you're not living out here. But I mean, I don't know. I told her I'd been with agents in New York, in St. Louis and Kansas City, but she rejected me, so. If, if it's meant to be for you, it's meant to be. Don't try to force yourself into it because it's probably not going to work. Eileen Ford said to me she didn't like my eyebrows. <laughs> that was it. But you know what? That didn't stop me. I, when I got turned down, I was definitely more determined than ever. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. I had to do it. MC Squared turned me down. Um, Muse had turned me down. Major had turned me down. Marilyn had just dropped me. Um, I think I'd met with DNA or women, one of them turned me down as well. That kind of competition requires very, very strong teeth. This industry is for a masochist. The rejection in this business when you go on a casting and you walk in and there are 30 other girls there and you're looking at all these girls and you're like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know? And they have their hopes up when they go and then you have to say, well, you didn't get that. They liked you, but they didn't get that. That's, that's a lot for a young girl to, to absorb at 16, 17 years old. If you're told that you're very smart and you don't do well in school, you're, you're going to falter. If you're told you're a great athlete and yet you don't succeed, um, and modeling is the same, beauty is the same. So if your value is really placed in one area of your life, and that's where you, that's where you put all your energies, and you falter, imagine, I mean, the disappointment's severe. I'm fairly disappointed that I haven't been able to, like, you know, obtain the status of being a shirtless a greeter, because I started back in March, and I told myself, by, by June, I'd have it, and I was like, all right, by July, by August, and here we are, September, and I'm like, well, you haven't done it yet. They want me to step out there when they know, like, all right, if you do this, like, you're going to blow the F up or something. So that's at least what I tell myself. I don't really look at it as rejection anymore. I think of it as, like, finding a place where they like me and I like them. I could not live my life punching in and punching out and sitting in the same cubicle day after day after day. It's not me. I had a lot more rejection in Germany, a lot more. Like, my agent said, you're too American. I don't think so, but... Or are you too sexy? If I had a fight with my wife and a kid came in and reminded me of her, I refused to represent her. Because why would I want somebody who reminds me of my wife every day driving me crazy to come into the agency and drive me crazy too? 
I mean, if I had a daughter, I would never suggest to be a model. I mean, never. I had another model. She's on a job at a very famous boutique on Rodeo Drive. I can't name it because I still work with them. Locked her knees. She passed out. They call an ambulance. As they're putting my 16-year-old, 5'11", beautiful girl in the ambulance, the boutique walks out. The, the salesperson rips the dress off her, sends her to Cedar sinai naked with a G-string on at 16, because the dress was more important than she was. I think that it, it's kind of sad because there are models and aspiring models that their dream is just to be the next cover girl or the next this, and they, their parents put so much money into it and they put so much time and effort, and they're beautiful people, granted, but they just, that's, the business is not forgiving. It doesn't care, you know, it has no feelings. He said I'm very, like, classic, like, all-American looking instead of, I guess, more like edgy or European looking. I called my boyfriend yesterday and he was like, well, you know what, forget them. Like, you're, you're beautiful and everything. And he's like, and you have so much going for you. They don't know what they're missing. I've met a lot of sad girls because uh, for not a lot of money, they work a lot, they walk a lot, they meet a lot of people and they are treated not always in a nice way. I mean, they're still girls. They're not the only models. And so sometimes he said. You know, you really have to take care of yourself, stay true to yourself, and really believe that you can do it. And, and you'll have it all. You know, for me, it was really hard. I was told I couldn't do this because I was too short. My skin was too brown. I wasn't pretty enough. But I thought, you know what? I feel it inside, and I know that I can do it. So I just wanted to prove everybody wrong. I stayed true to myself, stayed grounded. I stayed grounded. And there you have it. I've been traveling everywhere. I've been around the world many times. I've been on so many different shows. I've worked with some of the top A-list actors. I've made tons of millions of dollars. I live in a beautiful home, and I can now take care of my family because I didn't believe what people thought about me. And now the egg is on their face. I think that it's very refreshing when you meet somebody who hasn't been raked over the coals yet. <laughs> when I got signed with IMG, um, I was ecstatic. Uh, if they wouldn't have signed me, I would have had to quit modeling. And um, I'd exhausted all my options. The economy was tanked. They were the only ones left, and they were my last meeting. And when I saw them, Lisa wanted to sign me on the spot. Just pure joy to have the top agency in the world want to sign me when they only sign a couple girls a year. It's Julianne Moore, it's Julia Roberts, it's Halle Berry. It's women that are in the film industry that are doing the major campaigns. That was the creme de la creme. If you can get a campaign now, it seems that that would be nearly impossible. We were the pioneers in getting contracts for all these kids. Isabella Rossellini we represented. I mean, we represented them all. And then I always felt that there would be the synergy to get actors and actresses involved in you know, in the modeling business. But at that time, the stigma was, oh, we can't do anything unless we do it in Japan. But now, if you notice, every cosmetic, every high-end fashion house has a star, whether it's a TV star or a movie star. And you may ask, why? Why would Charlize Theron do Christian Dior when she's an Academy Award winner? and she makes movies that are fabulous because they do a day's work and they make almost as much money as they can make in a movie that takes maybe six months of their life. I think that it has interfered and hurt our industry. I don't know if it's the reason that there are no supermodels, but it certainly is the reason that we have a hard time getting a foot in those doors. I think that we choose our celebrities because we find them very intriguing. And they do have a story to tell. Whether it's someone like Kim Kardashian, who does a reality show, but the reality shows are a fascinating trend that we had to address. And usually, they have a great style. Nowadays, the market's so flooded, and there's so many people, I'm a model, I'm a model. It's just so different that 
you can't sustain yourself. You, there's no way you can survive. The stories behind Hoyt Richards being in a cult for 20 years are really quite disturbing. Any cult is disturbing, but then add in single most successful model, earning millions, gorgeous in a time of his life, being swung into some bizarre, deranged cult for 20 years. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a mystery, that one. I'll never be boring at cocktail parties. I can drop the atom bomb at any point, like, well, I was in a cult for 20 years, and walk away, people are like, did he just say he was in a cult? I think one of the reasons the cult had a deep interest in me probably was the way I looked, because ultimately the role I played was that of a recruiter. In essence, I became a poster child for the group and was there to attract other people looking like me, in a sense. And that was kind of the image they wanted to put out there. I thought it was such a blessing to be born looking the way I do and uh, that it was going to somehow be an asset for me. And in many ways, that was one of the very things that led me into this group and twisted my world into such a way that I never imagined. The name of the cult was the, uh, the Eternal Values. It was based in Manhattan. It was kind of good looking, kind of well-educated, successful um, leaders. How did you, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Frederick Von Mires with another platform across America. Frederick claimed that uh, he was from the star Octorus. And luckily, um, that's not something that uh, he would start the conversation with because then I would have thought he was crazy. Your soul is that which this moment is observing your mind, thinking whatever you're thinking Frederick is saying. One part of you is listening to Frederick. The other part is thinking about what Frederick is saying. And there's a third part of you observing you listening and thinking. He was an unusual guy. He was charismatic in his own way. And he was basically a person that had the capacity to brainwash people. And um, he had done so to our brother. The first time I met him, I thought, oh, yeah, the guy's charismatic, but he's a little strange. And, you know, it's not someone I would go follow. And yet, you know, John was enthralled with him. Well, I think uh, one of the ways that uh, I got sucked into the cult is that you hear from them probably everything that you've never heard enough from your parents. And that is how special you are, how unique you are, what great potential you have. It's almost like a drug in the sense that you want to believe that you could be something better than what you are. Our mother was very demanding. I mean, like, I mean, nothing was ever good enough. Your grades aren't good enough. You're not doing well enough. Freddie basically said to me, you know, you're different than your friends. You realize that. And I was like, different how? He goes, no, you're special. You're like, you don't think the same way they do. You're good looking, you know, you're obviously an athlete. You know, there is more to life than just scoring touchdowns, drinking beer and chasing girls. And I was like, really? <laughs> My first exposure to the group was uh, going to Studio 54. I was still at college and I used to visit Freddie up in New York. And he like knew the doorman at Fit Studio 54, so we'd all bomb in there. It was a crazy place. It was a place of dreams and fantasies, and as wild as it's been depicted in stories for all these years. I mean, my first time going, I was 18, uh, and I met this girl wearing nothing but scotch tape. And I'm thinking, I don't want to leave. People are, are, are screwing on the dance floor. There's like people doing cocaine everywhere. Like I went down, there's this area downstairs where I met like Andy Warhol and Truman Capote. And I mean, I saw crazy stuff. It was like, it was like Alice in Wonderland, like going through the looking glass into this realm. It was intoxicating. Going to Studio 54 during that time was something a lot of the models did because you, you did meet all the, the well-known designers and, and people in the entertainment industry. And in our business, in that business, exposure is key. I was living this double life. I'm Johnny Supermodel rocketing around the world, and I'm in a cult, and my whole life is being controlled. One of the main um, tools that these groups use is there's some sort of near-future apocalyptic event that no one else knows about, that you're being led in on the, on, the, on the skinny on. And, you know, basically, everyone's got their heads up their butt, but this is going to happen, and we're going to survive because we're going to go to the safe place. Or if we're really lucky, the aliens are going to come down and fly us out of here. And then after all, the shit hits the fan, then we'll drop us back on and then we get to you know, rule the planet. And they approached models and models gave up money, homes, boats. They gave up their lives to these people. 
How much money did you give the cult over the period? I guesstimate it's probably about four and a half million dollars. And never got anything back. I mean, I think it destroyed some of the people they got involved with. And you denounce everyone, your family, your loved ones, your friends, your husband, everybody. And if you have any issues with your family at all, which I think we all do, you know, this feeds right into the fact that you've got a completely spiritual, high-minded reason to basically tell your family, sorry, you know, I'm taking a different tact and, and see you later. I didn't see my parents, I think, for 12 years. It was basically cutting ties. I can completely lose my temper when I walk by and I hear some young junior agent saying, oh, you know what, there's this really good new diet. It's like, you know what, keep it to yourself. And another thing, when someone says, can I put you on a scale? It's like, really? Fuck you, why don't you get on a scale? Because I have never in 25 years asked a model what she weighed. I don't give a shit. My clients don't ask that. You know what they say? What size are you? You cannot eat at all. I, for myself, was an anorexic vegetarian. I lived on coffee with whipped cream. I was known to always have my can of whipped cream on me Great. to go on my coffee, and that's all I would have all day long, and cigarettes. I felt like I got more energy from cigarettes, and the, you know, you just are busy, 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 and auditions, and jumping on a plane, and flying over here, and it just, it is that lifestyle. For two months, one time I ate only carrots. And then for like three weeks, one time I ate only pineapple. I really went on binges because I was so underly thin. I, I really didn't get my period until I was 21. So I didn't have bloating. I just thought the girls who had their periods, I was like, oh, too bad. I'm skinny today. But I did worry if I would be able to get pregnant. And that was really important to me. Then I think that they don't eat and they try to stay thin. Or they're living on, you know, laxatives and other things like that, those happy things. One girl took cotton balls and dipped them in orange juice and ate them so that she would feel full. But I had one that was like, really? I am bulimic, I do throw up, and it's none of your fucking business. I was like, and done. Everyone always goes, oh, the girls, the girls, the girls. Next time at Thanksgiving, why don't you look at your son, who's a male model, why don't you see what he's eating? I do see a lot of guys very body conscious and almost look unhealthy in person, but you know, behind the camera, you look great. And then to them, like, what else really matters? Do I approach a model and say, you know what, I think you're really fucked up and you need to talk to someone? No. But oftentimes, if I think a model is, is bulimic, I'll ask them to lunch. Because they will eat because they don't want you to think they're bulimic. But oftentimes, they follow it up with a scoop of vanilla ice cream. And I know, because so many of them told me, that the reason they do that is because when you vomit, it doesn't burn. Every time I went in the agency, like, let me look at you. OK, you look too thin. Are you eating? You know. The opposite of what I saw a lot of girls going through on the other side. And I would rather have too skinny than too fat. Because around the corner was, were, you know, I'd be talking to one agent and there'd be another girl, very well known, who has to pull her pants down to her ankles to show her booker how fat she was. I was down to like 110 at some point. At 5'11", yeah. you weighed 110. Yeah. You get so wrapped up and immersed in the idea of being possibly, you know, Calvin Klein exclusive or, you know, Russell Mars with Prada. Or it's like, oh my God, I could possibly, you know, do an Yves Saint Laurent show in a week. Or, you know, it's just, it's just sometimes it gets to be kind of ugly and really tiresome. And another thing, it is not the agents that dictate the size of the model, it's the designer. The designer makes the clothes and it's the designer that sets the theme. So when I, take my kids to school and a parent inevitably says, you're contributing to the demise of the female soul because you are telling them that they need to look a certain way. And I said, actually, sister, in my industry, it's the women that makes more money than anybody. So actually, I'm helping women. It's time to fix my face because this is just not attractive. I got this from my rehearsal for Louis Vuitton when I was in Paris. A lot of people think we get a lot of free clothes, but we really don't. Um, some of the shows pay us in trade. Catalog is what I want to do right now, um, which is like lookbooks, like um, websites and stuff like that. And those are what pay like a couple grand a day, which is glorious. 
especially because I have a really nice credit card debt that's gotten racked up from all the traveling because despite what everyone thinks as well, we don't get flown around the world for free. We do have to pay for it ourselves. This industry is a lot smaller than people think it is. And a lot more screwed up. Yeah, but I love it. It beats me in college. Ow! Well, apparently I don't have the look that they are looking for right now, or they have too many people with my look. It's pretty disappointing when you come out here and you're expecting it all just to kind of fall into place and it doesn't. Well, my self-doubt is higher than when I first came out. Yeah, rejection's never fun in any industry, but in this one it seems to be 10 times as hard. I've thought about giving up, but I still have dreams of being a model and I still want to do that, but if, if it doesn't work out, then it's just not meant to be, I guess. I'm not sure that every model is looking way into the future and seeing what the rest of her career path will be. And I think that's something important. And it seems like a lot of models today, a lot of the big models do move on to second careers. Yes, I, I, I had my own escort service for a little bit. Um, got started because uh, one of my friends, we were out on a date and they, his friend liked me as well. And do you have any sisters? And I was like, no, I don't have any sisters, but I have some friends that are models, you know? So we arranged to have a date and um, she got ready. She went and got her nails done, got her hair done, got her, you know, went out, bought an outfit, took hours and hours and hours to get ready, went to the spa. Like it was, I was like, dang, you're getting, doing all of this just for this date. This guy had a lot of money. And uh, so she wanted to look her best. I was like, this is like a job, you know, you should be getting paid for this. Ding, 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 light went off in my head. and. Uh, I got her some money to go out on a date with them. A lot of money. It was like five grand just to go to dinner, you know? So I took my little percentage and then I asked my friends, I said, if you, you know, want you guys come to town and they want to go out or something, just let me know. And for a small fee, you too can have somebody that looks like Beverly Peel, you know? <laughs> just to see what I could do. It's like, you know, if everyone thinks you're such a good girl, it's like, you sell drugs, okay, I'll try it. Guns, I'll try it just for the time being, just to see how far and how much I can get away with. That was my rush, that was my drug of choice. When the Vanity Fair article hit, that's when really the, you know, the, uh, the shit hit the fan. The Vanity Fair article hit in 1990, and um, conveniently, uh, Freddie died five days before. So I got a lot of the heat you know, from that. In a crazy way, once the Vanity Fair article came out and people did think I was in a cult, that's when my career really took off. Freeze, you scuzz bucket piece of your trash. So from a certain point of view, the cult actually helped my career. Because, you know, you know the fashion business, everyone loves the drama. And I went from being this, like, Princeton guy who was kind of on time and professional. Well, now people think I'm into all this crazy shit, and they want to, like, book me and see if I'm going to, like, start talking about another planet or, or you know, or whether my eyes are going to roll back in my head. I don't know, but... I mean, all of a sudden, I became interesting. Really? Excuse me, aren't you that model that got a... Uh, what, charged with identity theft? Identity theft, Yes, yeah. I am that. Yeah, Beverly Steele. My name's Beverly Steele. Oh, did I say Beverly Steele? Oops. <laughs> I think that a lot of the speculation had to do with beauty and, this, and being a celebrity and being, you know, a supermodel. And um, I don't want to put race into it because Winona Ryder was a, an example. I think, I think that they needed an example. They wanted to set an example, and I was the one chosen. If you add everything and put everything together and ask all the questions, nothing makes sense. But it got to the point where I was literally driving myself cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over this, and my stupid-ass lawyer 
he was just one of those he was a media whore he just wanted to be in the limelight he wanted to be he allowed the cameras in the in the in the courtroom you know they put me on probate i did i was in jail for like damn near a month you know like locked up behind bars away from my family on two occasions because they said that I, I uh, violated my probation when I was doing all my community service. My probation officer was a bitch and she just had crabs up her ass and didn't like me because my hair was longer than hers. I hated my brother. He thinks I'm in a cult. Like, what an asshole. I think the point where really things broke off was in the early 90s. He was in Nantucket, our home, and I remember him saying flat out, Trying to explain, he goes, you know what? You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Boom. And that was it. It was like, that was the cutoff. And I'm like, uh, I, you know, that was a harsh moment yeah. in my life. But um, I don't think I saw him again from then until after I was married. You know, it's one of these things that it was a process I went through that was painful. And I'm just glad that uh, that I made it through it, because I know a lot of people don't. So I'm just thankful. And the stuff I missed, you know, I'm just thrilled to have the people I love in my life now, and that's what matters to me. And you know, you you learn that um, you're stronger than you ever imagined you are. And stuff like this is what teaches you that. Um, you know, I went to a really dark place where I, you know, I felt like. I, you know, I even considered, you know, killing myself and, and to have gotten through that and to reclaim my life and to be with the people I, I love and care about, you know, in some crazy way has made it wor worthwhile because it's almost like I appreciate it more now. And, um, and I wouldn't recommend that path for anybody else, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm just thankful. We are currently at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and I just finished my last final and I'm graduating, so I'm pretty excited because that's the sooner I get to actually move out to LA now. I'm very ready to go back to Los Angeles. I'm very excited to be there. Well, the meetings that I had, I mean, they can be discouraging, but you got to look past it. And I've been in contact with other commercial agencies there that want to meet with me when I get there too. So they at least seem interested. I'm living in West Hollywood now. I decided to leave New York just because it's been so crazy and work was a little bit too slow. And when I was in New York, I just learned how competitive it really is. Um, I mean, I feel like LA is not as intense with the modeling. Whereas in New York, all the girls, they live and breathe modeling. They just have to watch what they eat all the time. And that's another reason why I moved here is now I don't necessarily have to starve myself. It was my manager that called me and was just like, IMG's releasing you from your contract. And that was that. And I emailed my booker afterwards just to talk to her. And she said it was just because she was the only one that believed in me anymore. And none of the other bookers were behind me. So I, they probably just gave up on me after I wasn't working as much as they wanted. And I was really sad when they left, when I left them, but or when they left me. But I figured out that when you sign that contract with the agency, you pretty much sign away your body and they they decide what look they want for you, your hair, everything. At the end of the day, I'm just a rock and roll girl and I just want to work. And if they think I'll work with a shaved head, I'll shave my head, like. After 22, 23, a woman starts to become jaded by the industry and it starts to show in their soul, which then portrays in their physical appearance because the more jaded they become living in this industry, I think that their overall look begins to change because that aura, that air of confidence, that mantle that they carried, it's tainted and it's no longer able to be perceived as beauty. Hi, you must be Hi. Yes, I am. Come on in and sit down. I'm Suzanne Von Schock. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. I basically train models and help them package themselves and get their foot through the door so that they can actually get an agent mm -hmm. and that they can go on and have a career. Blondes used to be hot. 
but now is not the time. Everything is what they call Eurasian. Just as long as you're a mix. Beauty today is about being yourself and being yourself confidently. You can have great skin and you can have beautiful eyes and beautiful hair and I will be attracted to you. But if you open your mouth, you better be just as beautiful because if you have nothing to say, the looks are gone. <laughs> I love the beauty inside people, but then I also love the, the non-speaking pictures that speak so much to me. This I love. This again, you don't look like yourself. This is very pretty. They're very sophisticated, but when you go to New York and you come to LA, they're not going to do this to you. Want to know why? They've got so many girls that look like that that can do that naturally because they don't have to work at doing that. They just are that. The girls that are this, they can't look like you. I think that a true model will remain timeless and effortless, even if she has those qualities within her physical aesthetic, she's able to pull the look together as a whole and be timeless look. This is not something where, oh, well, she had a great mouth and she's forgotten about six months from now. You don't want that. You want your overall look, your overall aesthetic to be classic and timeless, kind of like the little black dress that stays in every woman's closet. A model should transcend the ages, whether we're looking at her now or in 50 years. Some girls, when they get in front of the camera, they can just kind of give and it, it has to bubble up from the side and it has to come out the eyes. And it's not necessarily in the smile. And see, in this picture, you have that. I mean, it was such a wonderful thing to be in that whole world. It was, it was a gift. I mean, here you are being employed because of how you look. I look back on the modeling days with, with such pride and, and, and such happiness because it really was one of the best times of my life. You know, occasionally I'll pull out the, the book, the portfolio, and look at the pictures. And sometimes you look at it, it's like, that's not even me. You know, sometimes I can't remember being in that position at that time, you know, taking that photo. It's always great to, to take a look at it and remember where you came from and where you are now. To me, a lot of beauty is from within. I mean, you have to be able to see a little bit beyond, but, you know, I, I think that everybody just wants to be pretty and beautiful. The thing that I consider to be beautiful is someone's spirit, their essence, their, their innate genuineness and kindness and, and that thing that just impacts you. Like when, you know, there's very few people you meet that are genuine. And when you do, they stand out like a, a sore thumb because it's like you, you don't meet that many people like that. But when you meet someone who really is coming from that place, that's beautiful to me. Beauty is not everything. It doesn't bring you happiness. It doesn't bring you Mr. Wonderful or Mrs. Wonderful. It's just a physical feature. We can change it, but the one thing I can't change is your attitude about yourself or other people's attitudes about you. I actually think um, experience and uh, wisdom you gather from age, and that's a sign of beauty in itself. Do you think you're beautiful? In my heart, yes. Beauty or brains? I'd probably pick brains. I do feel beautiful now. Beauty is, it, it is, it's a very enjoyable topic. In the, in the negative ways, you can call it an obsession. In the positive ways, you can call it an interest or a hobby. And people love talking about it. And it's usually about themselves. I think it's a great business. And I think if it's something you want, you gotta really go out and do it.
Having another baby. Yes, one more for the road. That's that's how I put it. <laughs> he was always smiling. He was always laughing. He was always the life of a party. And he was not that for 20 years. And now he's just back to that. And it's nice to see someone smile, you know, and laugh. And he's got a great smile. Beauty to me is my son. Very good. Very, very good. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> You're beautiful.